Thank you, Brother John. Take your Bibles, if you would, please. Open to the book of Matthew, chapter 25. Matthew, chapter 25, in God's Word tonight. We finished up the book of 1 John, and so I have a message, a couple of different messages along the way before we start a new passage to study. But in Matthew, chapter 25, we come across a parable, a teaching of Jesus Christ. A teaching that I believe uh, will affect us in 2020 and affect the folks of First Baptist Church. You see, it's easy to look around and to say it's someone else's responsibility. Especially at First Baptist Church. Oh, someone else will sing, someone else will teach, someone else will drive the bus, someone else will pick that up, someone else will teach that class, someone else will encourage for them, someone else will make that meal. It's easy to pass the buck. It's easy to sit that way during a sermon and think about everyone else who needs that truth from God's Word. I've been guilty of that before. Maybe you have as well. As a pastor or speaker is preaching, you're thinking, boy, I hope so-and-so is listening. They really need that. You ever done that before? You know, some of your wives are like, yeah, I think it's about my husband all the time. I hope he's listening right now. And jab him, wake him back up. Matthew chapter 25, we have a familiar parable. The parable of the talents. Would you look in God's word, Matthew chapter 25, beginning in verse number 14. For Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country, who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. This master called his own servants, not someone else's servants, not someone else's, but his own servants, and gave them of his own goods. He didn't say, I'm going to call your servants and give them of your things. He grabbed his own servants, giving them of his own goods. The good master gave good gifts. Verse number 15. And unto one he gave five talents, and to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them other five talents. And likewise, he that had received two, he also gained other two. But he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. And after a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto them, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Then he, which had received the one talent, came and said, Lord, I knew thee, that thou art an hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid. And went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. His Lord answered and said to him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sow, not and gather where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then, and then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury. Take therefore the talent from him, and give unto him which hath ten talents. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. Lord, I thank you for the time tonight, for your word, for your spirit which touches and convicts. Lord, I pray that tonight you'd help us to be good soil, good listeners. Lord, help me as I speak. Help me to say those things that would be profitable, that would be true with your word, Lord. And take your word and would you touch our hearts. Lord, may we not waste what you've given to us. But Lord, may we be profitable servants for your glory and your honor. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. 
waste for disgrace or invest to be blessed. I began working on this sermon probably a year and a half ago. Like, wow, Pastor, how does it take you that long to write a sermon? Yes, it does sometimes. Yes, it does sometimes. This particular truth I began to study in this parable, some things that I had never quite put together in this way before, I believe. Some of it will be common and maybe a couple thoughts for you at the end to, to dwell on and think upon. Maybe, parents, you've said this or kids, you've heard this. As you finish eating, you go to empty your plate in the trash can and there's still some food left on the plate. And maybe your parents or your children have heard this, don't throw that food away. There are children starving in... Name any country, right? About all have been listed. Cross world Africa, and Africa's a normal one, that would eat that. But what's your response to that? You may not know this, but there are some times in my life that if I'm not careful, I'll be sarcastic. I know it's a surprise to you. All the thoughts that I wish I could have said to my parents. No, those kids wouldn't eat that. Not even the dog would eat that. What are you trying to do? Kill the entire population of a third world country? You can't eat that food. Or if they want that food, they can come and get it. That's right. It's right here. I package it up in the trash can for them. They can have it right here. The fact is, in America, we waste a lot of food. I, I looked up how much we wasted because, you know, you can Google that. I don't know who counted this. Whoever did uh, needs to find a new, a new job in life. That's, that's really a thing to count how much food we waste. 80 billion pounds a year in America we waste of food. 80 billion pounds or 40 million tons of food. How much is that, Pastor? How I'm glad you asked. It is a thousand Empire State Buildings all put together. That's how much food. Or roughly 200, I think it's 219 pounds of waste per person. 219 pounds. That's a lot of pounds of ribeye steak that would be. That's a lot of money right there. Or we waste in America 30 to 40% of the entire food supply. Of all the food in America, we waste 30 to 40 percent of it. Well, that's a travesty, is it not? I mean, that, that, that is wasteful. It is, it is wasteful, all right? I'm not here to, to preach on poverty, but it, but it is wasteful. All right, we ought to be good stewards of, of what God has given to us. I get after my kids when they throw food away, and I know you good parents do the same thing. Right, save that, all right? And if you don't like that, you need tomorrow, all right? And if you don't eat then you eat the next day. You're not eating anything else until you finish that on your plate right there. Come on, well, any parent worth their salt has said that at least once in their time of parenting. Ah, we waste food. Why? Sometimes we're just full. Oh, I can't eat another bite, said the teenager, and 30 seconds later, all right, his story changed. There's nothing to eat in this house. Everyone said that at least one time. What that translates is, there's nothing that I want to eat at this moment in this house. Any house in this place, and... And, and maybe we're not the richest in America, but we can go to our houses right now. You can open up your cupboards. You can find food upon food with a multiplicity of choices, can't you? Open your fridge and, and you've got choices. And we waste it. But my sermon is not about food tonight. You gathered that, didn't you? It could be a good sermon on food. We could preach for a while on food, Brother Taylor, couldn't we? We could preach on that and have an altar call on food, but that's not what this, this parable is about. It's not about food. Tonight I want to preach on with God's help about how we waste the gifts that God gives to each one of us. I'm talking about the talents and the gifts of grace that God has given to every single person in this auditorium and on live stream. If you're a child of God, God has given you something. He is the good master. And what a travesty, though. It's a travesty to waste 80 billion pounds of food or 40 million tons. There's a greater travesty going on, and that is talents that God has given to Christians being wasted day in and day out in the house of God, in the church of God. Talent of voice. There's some of you out there who should be up there singing. Talent. Wasted, a travesty, 80 billion pounds of food, and we would say, oh, let's do something about it. But what about the gifts that God has given to every single Christian? Talents of encouragement, gifts of encouragement. 
Some of you just know what to say at the right time. I wish I had that gift. I have the other gift. Foot in mouth disease? Some of you have that gift as well. Oh, but some of you got as gifted you to know how to encourage and be right there. Some of you, some of you ladies and men too, boy, you can cook uh, I'm, uh, an amazing, I mean, in a chef boyardee way, a kind of amazing cook. Man, talents. Some of you can explain truth and open up God's word in masterful ways. Ways far better than I could ever do. Talents. Gifts that God has given. What a travesty that we would waste those things. Yet we sit in here week in, week out, and we think someone else will do it. Someone else will fill that spot. Someone else will teach that class. Someone else will sing that song. Someone else will play that instrument. Someone else will ride that bus. A waste. A waste. We'll look tonight at this parable. Some truths from God's word. The first thing I see in this passage is there's a rationing. There's a rationing from the good master to the servants, his own servants, of his own supply. And I notice this, everyone received something. Everyone got something. He didn't say, well, I'm all out, so you get nothing, have fun. Every servant, all three servants got something. You know, Scripture tells us that about Christians as well. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. That's 1 Corinthians. Ephesians, but unto every one of us as Christians is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Romans 12 tells us this, So we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. Scripture is filled with God using men and women in unique circumstances with the gifts that God had given to them. Every one of us has received something from God. Every single person, I don't care how old you are or how young you are, how tall you are, how short you are, you've received something. How smart you are or how unintelligent you may think you are, we have all received something. We can't say, God, you didn't give me anything because that's not true. God has blessed every single person with some talents, with some gifts. Everyone has received something. Will you say that with me? Everyone has received something. Try that again. Everyone has received something. But everyone has received something different. Everyone received something different. See, the talent that God has given to you, He hasn't given to me. And what He's given to me, He's not given to you. He's made each one of us unique. And I'm so glad for the uniqueness that God has given to us. The Bible says it this way, according to His several, verse 15, ability. The Master made the distinction. You know, we have a problem in our current culture. We call this the Fairness Doctrine. We want everything to be fair. And by fair, in our minds, that means you can't have more than me because that's not, help me. Oh, no, no, you got to say it with a little bit of a whine. That's how people say it, right? They don't say, I want things to be fair. How do they say it? I want things to be fair. Right? Come on, help me one more time. I want things to be fair. Your parents can be guilty of this. Well, that's not fair that their kid had a chance to be in the Christmas play. My kid is just as talented, and that's not, help me, fair. Well, it's not fair that they got a new vehicle. Well, why are they such a better Christian? I've been a great Christian my whole life. I've been to church more than they've been to church. I deserve a nicer vehicle. That's not, help me, fair. fair. <laughs> well, look at their house. It's nicer than my house. Why would God do that for them? That's not fair. fair. We have a problem with the fairness doctrine. We think everything should be, quote, fair, and we've redefined what fair is. You know that fair does not equal equal? I'll say that one more time for you. Fair does not equal equal. You know what's fair? Getting what I deserve. All right, so is this fair? If I and Brother Rob here both work, all right, at the same place, and they pay me double. We work the same hours. That's not equal, and that wouldn't be fair. We would be given what I deserve. But also, would it be fair if I worked one hour, and he worked ten hours, and I got more money than him? We'd say, that's not fair. I didn't get what I deserved. 
All right. And if I look in the scripture, I find out exactly what I deserve. You know what that is? Separation from God. That's what I deserve. I don't deserve any blessings in my life. I don't deserve any talents. I don't deserve to be used by God. There's nothing good in me. All my righteousness is as filthy rags. There's nothing good inside me. That's what's fair. But God is better than fair. And he as the master has decided that he's going to give different abilities to different people. And that's okay. You know what? I will never sing like Brother Dalton. I won't do it. I won't. God didn't, didn't make me that way. Didn't build me that way. And I can sit here and wallow on the floor and kick my feet and cry about it. Or I can use what God has given to me. You hear me? I will never preach like Pastor Olette. Man, that man can turn a phrase. Now don't say amen too quickly. I'm still here. I can still hear you. My hearing still works just fine. I've been asked, what does, it, what does it feel like to follow Pastor Olette? That's fine. I couldn't imagine following a better pastor in my life, a better preacher. It is a blessing. We were talking today in the office. What a blessing he's been in my life as a personal uh, mentor and just a friend to me. I get to talk to him regularly. He answers, he answers when I call him. Usually, if not, he calls me back if he's in a different time zone. I'll never preach like him. And I can sit there and wallow about it, but I'm not worried about that because God's made me like he wants me to be, and he's made you just like he wanted you to be. Some of you are really athletic. I think your brother Golden is. He's quite an athlete. He can play basketball really well. I will never be gifted like that. Even if I work just as hard as he has, and he's worked hard in his life to get to that point. It didn't happen overnight. He's gifted. And I can sit here and I can wallow in that and say, why is it not fair that he can make a three-pointer and I, I can just make air balls all day. I can make them consistently too. I can sit here and wallow right here, can't I? Or I can find out how God has blessed me. You see, he's given everybody something. Everyone receives something. But everyone has received something different. We look around and we start to compare. We say, boy, if I had that talent, well, I'd use it for God, that's for sure. If I could sing that way, well, you better believe I'd be in the choir, that's for sure. If I could teach that way, if I could preach that way, if I could encourage that way, you better believe. But the problem is not if we receive something or how, but the excuses that we make. And we spend a lot of time saying, well, I wish I had what they had. If we're not careful, you get caught in the fairness doctrine. Well, that's not fair. But God is so much better than fair to you and to me. I'm glad God is not fair. I'm glad God is full of grace and mercy. That's a lot better than Him being fair. I look around and I see grace and mercy replicated in all these lives out here. What we deserve, the choices we've made. Can you imagine if God was fair and let us reap the decisions, every decision we've made? We'd be broke, homeless, and probably dead, most of us. But God, who is rich in His mercy... Wherewith he has loved us, all right? So it's not about fair. We've all received something different. Well, if I, if I had the money that you had, I'd be generous too. Really. I didn't know that generosity started a certain amount of money. I didn't know that at this particular amount, now you're generous, but up to that point, then generosity can't happen. Why they get that money? God is always right. He's always right. But he's not always equal in how he gives talents. The other side of it is this. We say, you know what? Why do I have to do so much? Well, why did God give me so many? Why did he give me five talents to worry about? I'd be happy just with one. I'm always running around doing this and running around doing that. You see, Brother Dalton, he has to sing here a lot, doesn't he? We make him sing, sometimes twice in a row. Trying to knock him off, aren't we? Slowly but surely. What a way to go. If you, if you drop over here singing, we'll say nice things about you, Brother Dalton. I promise, we'll say nice things. Can you imagine that service, by the way, on a side? Can you imagine that service? If you drop over dead in this pulpit, I tell you what, we'll have altar call right there, all right? <laughs> tell you, don't please, don't. 
All right, because I have to delay the message I'm preaching. Brother Dawn could say there, well, why? I'm, I'm always practicing. I'm always having to sing another song. Why, why, why do I have to sing again? Let someone else sing. I don't care. But God is always right. He's given some five and some two and some one. And you can put whatever number you want, ten and five and one or a hundred and three and two. It doesn't matter. The point is, we all receive something. It's all different. There's a rationing. But there's also a responsibility in this passage. The responsibility... The master gave these talents, and then he left. He gave, the first thing he gave, he gave some time. You see, we all have time. We all have the same amount of time. All these servants had the same time until the master came back. He didn't come back early just for one and not for another. He gave them all the same amount of time, and then the master left. But I can tell you something, my friend. The master might have left, but he is coming back. He's coming back, and some, some procrastinate. Boy, we procrastinate life sometimes. So I read this interesting phrase. They said this, the next time you find yourself tempted to procrastinate, here's what you do. Put it off. procrastinate about your procrastination, then you'll get the job done. I don't know what kind of, what kind of crazy, what crazy theory that is. But I know that some Christians procrastinate with their talents. I'll help next week. You know what? The next time this comes up, ask me then, Pastor. I'll help you the next time. The, the, the next class that opens, I'll do that one. The next bus that needs driving, I'll do that one. The next soul winning, the next prayer meeting, I'll do that one. Some procrastinate. But some are profitable. Boy, two of these servants, they buckled down, didn't they? They buckled down and got down to business. I think we can look around and not only here, but other churches, we see people who are profitable. There's some interesting statistics out there. They say that, that often 80% of the work of a church is done by 20% of the people. Once again, if that's your job to figure that out, get a new job. Just like the whole 80 million pounds of food. But it's probably true that it seems like some of your faithful workers are the same ones who seem to pop up all over the place. We have a work day, the same ones show up who are maybe driving the bus, who are singing a choir. You have to wonder, as a pastor, you have to wonder what would happen if everyone began to use their talent for Jesus Christ. Can you imagine what God can do in little bitty Saginaw, Michigan, if this church, we're not the largest church, we're not the smallest church, we're just the right size, we're looking for more people. All right, can you imagine if everyone here tonight, just on the sound of my voice and on live stream, began to use their talent for Jesus Christ? Some are profitable. Can you imagine we'd have too many meals to give to, to, give to folks? Many of you help with that. I appreciate that. We make meals when someone has a baby and have a neat little app that you can sign up on. Can you imagine? Listen, stop. We have too much. Too much food. Stop. Stop coming choir. You're going to have to go to A and B because we can't fit you up there. Listen, we've got to build another building for Sunday school classes because we've got way too many people teaching. Can you imagine if we all get challenged to become profitable? There was time, but there was trust as well. There was an expectation here from the master. I wrote it this way. The expectation was understated. The master gave the talent, and that's basically all we see. He didn't say, now listen, I'm going to give you five talents. I want you to invest in this stock and put it right here and do this over here. And after two months, when it hits this percentage, you sell it over here and put it back over here. He didn't say that, did he? There was an expectation, an understated expectation. Here, I'm going to give this to you. I expect you to do something profitable with it. It was understated, but it was understood. It's the best for the master's use. Christian, it can help be understood that when God has given us gifts and talents and blessings, they're for His glory. It's not for you, it's not for me, it's for the kingdom of Jesus Christ. I like the song that Dalton sang, To Count for Jesus. 
I want my life to count for Jesus Christ. Before the Lord, I, I want to stand before Him one day and hear Him say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. I want my life to count for Him. We have just one life. We don't have a lot of time here. That Master gave a little amount of time to these servants. I don't know how long it was, and I'm glad the Scripture doesn't say that. A little amount of time we have it may be today, maybe the last day I'm on earth. And I hope, I want, I pray that my life, I'm not talking about you, my life counts for Jesus Christ. I want to spend and be spent for Jesus Christ. The responsibility. Boy, some of us as Christians, we think our responsibility is heading toward the weekend. Day off. I'm working all week so I can take Saturday off. You've got to work around my house. I have no problem working around the house. I often work around the house. But that's not why we're here on earth, to make sure grass is cut just right. And I love cutting grass. Right? I, I, like, I enjoy cutting grass. But that's not why I'm here on earth. It's not about that. It's about Him and the kingdom of God. See, lastly, there's a rash thing. There's a responsibility. There's a reckoning. There is a reckoning. Maybe even some thoughts about this reckoning as we finish the sermon tonight. First of all, understand this. Every single servant gave an account. All three of them. And every single Christian in this room, out of this room, everyone who's been saved, will give an account to Jesus Christ. For things done in the body. Not in payment for our sin. We know that Christ's blood washed that away. But we will give an account of how we have lived and what we have done with what Jesus, what God has given to us to use for Him. We will give an account. I've seen this a few times and I like what it says. It says there is a 0.0296% chance that your child will become a professional athlete. But there's a 100% chance that they will stand before Jesus. My friend, there's a 100% chance that you will stand before Jesus Christ. Everyone stands before Jesus Christ. Those who are unsaved stand before Him in judgment. Those who are saved, when accountability, what we have done, you will give an account. I will give an account. And at that day, those excuses that you have, they won't matter a lick. They won't matter a lick. Well, Lord, if you'd only given me that talent, it's not going to hold water that day. Lord, you don't realize my job took up too much time. It's not going to hold water that day. Lord, you don't realize that I had to give up every Saturday for bus calling with that ministry. It's not going to hold water on that day. Those excuses do not matter. We will all give an account to Jesus Christ. Are you ready to give an account? It's in speech class. Come to class prepared to give a speech. And the teacher will randomly draw names. Get to class. You're not ready. And you breathe a sigh of relief when you narrowly dodge the bullet. Problem is, Christian, you will not dodge the bullet of a reckoning with Jesus Christ. You won't miss it. I promise you, you will not miss it. You will give an account. And no excuse will hold water. Second thought is this, no one will be compared to anyone else. When we give an account, I'm not going to be prepared, compared to somebody else. I'm not compared to, to Pastor Callie and he's not compared to me. I'm compared to what I have. I only answer for myself. Corinthians says this way, for we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves for they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. We got to stop comparing. We got to stop comparing. Oh, I can't do that. I, 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 I'm not going to. If I had that talent, I would. Well, some of you can solve problems just like that. I wish I had your mind for problem solving. But I'm not compared to how you solve problems. I'm compared to, to myself. Some of you can handle finances, and I struggle my way through finances and make sure I try to handle the church's finances well. And some of you have a mind for finances. Boy, you can see a clear path and a great solution. 
I'm not compared to you. You're not compared to me. You're compared to yourself and what God has given to you. It's not about me versus you. It's about you using and me using what God has given to me and what God has given to you. See, no one will be compared to anyone else. Lord, you don't understand. You don't understand. Principle for 12 years, if I had a dollar. Well, Pastor J.D., you just don't understand. Well, help me understand then. You can't say that to the Lord. He always understands, doesn't he? He sees where you're coming and where you're going. Next thought is this. The amount gained wasn't as important as the investment that was made. You know, the master doesn't say, Wow, you had five in you. You doubled that. Boy, hmm. Wish you would have got six there. Hmm. Boy, so close, but you're out of here. The next gentleman in this particular account who had two. The Lord doesn't say, the master doesn't say to him, Wow, you only had two and you got two. Boy, wish you'd gotten five like that guy over there. The amount wasn't as important as the investment that was made. Ten and five or five and two. The amount didn't matter. What was done with it is what mattered. What was done with it? You say, well, pastor, I feel like I'm stuck in a side closet teaching a class. Then teach in that side closet until Jesus comes back. Amen. Pastor, I've only got one person in my class. Then that one person better be so, it, it, with God's word, so infused with God's word because you can give all your attention to that one person. It doesn't matter the amount, but the investment that was made, that's what matters. Don't miss this. More servants were rewarded than were judged. That encourages my heart. I mentioned this a few weeks back in church, but man, I used to, I used to think, boy, you know, am I going to hear that well done now good and faithful servant? I think it is true in this account, this parable, two-thirds more heard it than didn't hear it. God has not set this up so we can't hit it. He's not said, well, like, he's not saying, well, you got so close yet so far. He's saying, it's possible. You can invest for me and uh, honor my kingdom. You can hit it. And lastly tonight, probably the main, if you have one main thought, take this thought away. The wasted talent was wasted because of carefulness, not corruption. When I began to study this particular talent and this particular parable, this last truth really gripped my heart. I realized something as I've been to study, and you probably realized this way before me. But this last guy, the guy who got judged, the one who was, was unprofitable, the one who was condemned, or the one who was, who was rebuked and reprimanded, he didn't, he didn't hurt the talent. If it was a voice, he didn't use it singing for the devil in bars. In fact, when the master came back, the talent was exactly like it was given to him. It was pristine. It was perfect. Nothing, nothing had happened to the talent that had been given to this man. It wasn't wasted. I'm sorry, it wasn't corrupted. He hadn't left it out in the rain and it got rusty. He hadn't sold it to be used in some ill gain. No, no, no. This talent, as he brought it back to the master, as he presented it, it was pristine. It didn't even end up in the devil's workshop. It was carefully, carefully wrapped. You see, wasting a talent is not so much about using it wrongly as not using it. Wasting a talent is not so much about using it wrongly as it is about not using it at all. The servant, Lord, I didn't waste your talent. Here it is, just like you gave it to me. I've got it for you. You know, you know that, 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 that money you gave me? It's right here. It's, it's perfect. I didn't mess up your talent. You should be happy. I had a good plan for your talent. This guy had a great plan. I'm going to bury it in the ground, and when he comes back, I'm going to dig it out of the ground. It's a great plan. And his plan worked, in his view. The problem 
was that the purpose of the talent was to further the kingdom. The problem was that the purpose of the talent was to further the kingdom. Your money, purpose, further the kingdom. Your voice, further the kingdom. Your mind to solve problems, further the kingdom. Your encouragement, further the kingdom. Your compassion, further the kingdom. Your ability to serve, further the kingdom. Whether it's driving a bus or whether it's helping a Sunday school class or in a choir, your job, my job with our talent is to further the kingdom. Yet this man took this talent and added her a $50 bill. Not a lot of money, but it's not no money either. He wrapped it in a careful napkin. Make sure that nothing would happen to it. Nice and clean. I got a pot of dirt here. He took that talent. Put it right in the pile of dirt. And he said, that will be safe until the master comes back. He told the master, he said, I'm afraid. It's interesting that the Lord would bring that particular point up for us. Fear of failure. Fear of failure caused the man to bury his talent. Fear of failure. I knew that I was a hard man. Now the passage says austere. I knew that, that when you came back, you, you would really, really give me the accounting. You'd give me the business. And so I was afraid. The Bible says I was afraid. Too many Christians bury that because they're afraid. Can I tell you something? If you use your talent for Jesus Christ, you're going to mess up. You're going to. You're going to be preaching. You're going to be teaching. You're going to say Mordecai instead of Haman. Can I get an amen? Come on now. You're going to mess up sometimes, right? Problem is when you mess up in church, I have a wonderful room of people who will never let me forget it. Thank the Lord. You're going to be singing sometimes. You're going to come in at the wrong time. Say the wrong words. You're going to. You're going to teach the Sunday school class. You're going to say something wrong sometimes. You, listen, you are, because we're humans, we're going to mess it up sometimes. But too many people bury that thing right there. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. You're like, Pastor, after church, I'm going to go dig that $50 out. <laughs> and now you know how I feel as your pastor. Because some of you bury that talent. I wish I could dig it out. I wish I could use it. I wish I could. And some of you would, would during invitation, dig this out when eyes are closed. And I wish I could dig it out. Say, listen. You see this talent? You see what God has given you? Use it for Jesus Christ. Use it to further the kingdom. Come on, use it. Hey, we got a spot right here. Th th this will work. Pastor, I'm afraid. Fine, fine. You're going to mess up, all right? And when you do, we'll laugh about it. Fine, that's okay. We'll tease you. But you can use it for Jesus Christ. So that one day when you stand before him, he'll say to you, well done. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You have a talent tonight? The answer is yes, you do. But the real question is, are you using what you have for his kingdom? You stand before him one day. You are. I don't want you to say that day, well, I never heard it at church, because now you heard it at church. You know where it's at in God's word. Would you use it? Don't bury it. Dig it out. Pastor, it's not much. It's just what God wanted you to have. So use it. I don't see how much it will do. Of course you won't. Put it in his hands. He'll do something great with it. He'll do something that'll blow your mind. Just don't bury it. Don't bury it. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, you've blessed each of us in so many ways. Lord, help us to use what we have for you. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Just a moment, we'll stand to our feet. 
I wonder if God touched your heart tonight. I wonder if you've buried a talent. You've buried a gift from God. Oh, maybe because of fear. Maybe for another reason. My friend, would you, would you dig it up? Would you take it out and brush it off? Would you let God use it? He'll do something great. He'll do something amazing. And when he does that, then he'll even say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. He would say, Pastor, as you spoke, God spoke to me. There's something I need to dig out of the ground. Would you pray for me that I would use what God has given to me for him? Who would say with an upraised hand, that's me. Amen. Hands all over. Amen. Amen. That's me. Amen. Amen. Lord, you've seen these hands. Lord, what you could do with us if we just surrender and let you use us. Lord, may we not waste the talents you've given to us. Lord, you've seen the hands, you know the hearts. May we follow you in obedience in Jesus' name. We stand to our feet. The piano is already playing. The altar's open. If you need to do business with God, you do that now. You come now. Thank you for the grace you've given to us. Lord, help us 